Are morals invented or discovered? Who has the right to judge what's right and wrong for other people? What is tolerance? And is it really possible or even good? Let's talk about it. Today we will discuss relativism versus objectivism. In this lecture, we will ask who is to judge what's right and wrong? Relativism versus objectivism, a defense of objectivism. And we'll discuss three kinds of absolutism. So first, who's to judge what's right and wrong? This is the main question for relativism and objectivism. If you see someone doing or thinking something wrong, would you tell them? For example, an acquaintance of yours tells you their view on abortion, global warming, racism, gender rights, or some other political debate, and you disagree with them. Do you know that you are right? Would you tell them that they are wrong? If people of another culture have different views on women's or children's rights, can we judge them? What if they move to the USA? Do they have to adopt American culture? Can we tell them that their religion is wrong? If someone comes to your front door on Christmas and says they're going to rape, torture, and murder your whole family, can you tell them they're wrong? The Nazis had a national culture of racism. Can we judge them and their culture? These are some questions just to get us thinking about judgment. Were your answers to those questions consistent? Or did you sometimes answer yes and sometimes no? Can we judge what's right and wrong, never, sometimes, or always? If you answered never, you probably think something like this. What I think is moral is just my opinion, so I can't tell someone else their opinion is wrong. If you answered sometimes, you probably think that at least some things are obviously wrong for all people. Why are some things universal and some things not? Are you being inconsistent? If you answered always, what gives you the right to judge other people's opinions as wrong? These are anti-Trump, Antifa, far-left protesters. They are, are they right or wrong for getting violent in their protest? Were the Trump supporters right for fighting this violence with violence? So we have violence on both sides now. Who's to judge what's right and wrong? Can you? What gives you the right? These are far-right, alt-right, white supremacists. Are they right or wrong to protest? Was it right or wrong for an alt-left person to drive a car into this crowd? America's current culture tends to cause us to say that we cannot judge other people for their choices. People can choose what they want, even if we don't like it. We are told to tolerate other people's opinions and beliefs. What is tolerance? Should tolerance not tolerate the intolerant? Who are the intolerant? Every opinion affirms something while denying its opposite. Every yes is also a no. If a group of people hold an opinion we do not like, should we tolerate them? What if their opinion is that we are wrong? We'd like to say people can have their opinions so long as they don't harm others. White supremacists usually meet peacefully. Should we tolerate them? Tolerance in today's culture means accepting people, no matter what their beliefs are. But we don't want to tolerate intolerance, such as hate speech. Do we need to accept everyone's beliefs? What if they're harmful beliefs? Think of terrorism, cults, or other beliefs that are either violent or exploit people. Not only that, but who is to judge that a certain belief is terrorism or a cult or other beliefs? What is hate speech? Today, those who oppose homosexual marriage on religious grounds are lumped in with racists despite religious freedom and freedom of speech. So how far does hate speech go? Perhaps it does apply to both of these groups. Perhaps it does not. Who should we not tolerate? That's ultimately what I'm getting at. 
with these examples. As the list grows, for those who we should not tolerate, tolerance begins to look a lot more like tyranny. Only one opinion is tolerated. Those who oppose it are intolerant and speak hate speech. Is that the case? Is Are the people who are advocating tolerance really all very similar to each other? If that's the case, then perhaps those who are advocating for tolerance are the least tolerant. Who knows? Tolerance is not the same as respect, and this is not the same as acceptance. Respect has two definitions. First definition, peaceful interaction that supports the other person's freedom without intentional hostility. This is the respect that we are after. Another definition of respect is a trusted reputation earned through prior good merit. Of course, not everybody earns our trust, but that's different than saying peaceful interaction where we are supporting another person's freedom without intentionally being hostile. But if we are advocating tolerance and we start to say that all of these other people, lots and lots of people are intolerant and that those that their intolerance, their so-called hate speech should not be tolerated, then who are you to judge that all of these people are not tolerable? It seems that in the name of tolerance, we tend to have apathy or intolerance. If you don't conform to a very politically correct, pluralistic kind of ideal, then you should not be tolerated because your ideas are critical or judgmental or challenging or something along these lines. Critical thinking is more important than censorship. Instead of thinking about who we should tolerate and not tolerate, instead of thinking about who we should silence because they give hate speech and who we should encourage because they give peaceful speech, we should think rather in terms of critical thinking because censorship is ultimately against the freedom of speech that our country supports. So in advocating critical thinking, what we're advocating is that we think for ourselves. If you're a critical thinker, then when you are faced with a belief that you do not like, you won't get angry, you will just have a helpful discussion where you both compare your reasons. This is why I believe this, and you tell me why you believe what you believe, and we have a respectful conversation that is peaceful, where I do not feel like I have to accept your belief. Of course, I will want to accept your belief if it is the more rational belief, but I cannot know if your belief is rational or not until I talk to you. I cannot talk to you unless I have a peaceful interaction that respects and supports your freedom without intentional hostility. This is the respect that we're after, which is different than tolerance and different than acceptance. Censorship seeks to silence people. It does not tolerate intolerant people. Critical thinking respects diversity, encourages dialogue, and is not afraid of challenging or offensive ideas. Aristotle says it is the mark of an educated mind to be able to entertain a thought without accepting it. Exposure to challenging and offensive ideas is good, diverse, and encourages independent thinking. Censorship seeks to protect people from ideas, causing everyone to think the same without realizing it. So if we are afraid of hate speech, if we are afraid of being offended, if we do not if we want to silence everyone who has hate speech, if we want to silence anyone who is offensive, then we are seeking censorship instead of freedom. 
and we are trying to protect people from ideas. Instead of allowing fruitful, peaceful discussion, and instead of encouraging diversity, we are encouraging everyone to think the same. Are you a leaf or an anchor? If you recall in an earlier video, I talked about a leaf or an anchor. A leaf is one that feels free, but ultimately it's pushed around wherever the wind and the waves go. So if we encourage censorship, then that means that we really want everyone to conform to a certain set of beliefs. We, want every, we do not want people to think for themselves. We want people to think only in this certain line of belief. That's a leaf. That's censorship. And ultimately, that is what most discussions about tolerance are after today. But an anchor does not often feel free because it is anchored down. It is tied down by a chain to something heavy. But it has the choice whether to set the anchor down and stay put or pull the anchor up and ride the waves. It's the anchor's choice whether or not the tides of culture and the winds of change are reasonable or not. See my critical thinking videos for more on this illustration. Also, the non-lecture videos that I ask you to watch are for the purpose of exposing you to challenging ideas. I may or may not agree with them or even some of the ideas in this own, uh, my own lecture video, but they're for the purpose of exposing you to challenging ideas so that we can figure out who is most rational. So who's to judge what's right and wrong? We need to ask a deeper question. What is truth? So let's talk about relativism versus objectivism. Specifically, this is going to be a defense of objectivism. Ethical relativism is the doctrine that knowledge, truth, and morality exist in relation to culture, society, or historical context, and are not absolute. John Ladd summarizes this view, saying, Ethical relativism is the doctrine that the moral rightness and wrongness of actions varies from society and that there are no absolute universal moral standards binding on all men at all times. Accordingly, it holds that whether or not it is right for an individual to act in a certain way depends on or is relative to the society to which he belongs. So relativism, the first principle I want to point out, is what is considered morally right and wrong varies from society to society, so that there are no universal moral standards held by all societies. Second, whether or not it is right for an individual to act in a certain way depends on or is relative to the society to which he or she belongs. Third, Therefore, there are no absolute or objective moral standards that apply to all people everywhere at all times. Is this an absolute statement, I ask you? There are no moral absolutes. If that's an absolute statement, it seems like it's going to be a self-defeating circular reasoning. There are no moral absolutes. If that's true that there's no moral absolutes, but this statement is itself an absolute, then it defeats itself. If it's false, that there are no moral absolutes, then of course it's false. So it seems like there has to be some kind of absolutes. Let's keep talking about ethical relativism. A summary from Lise Pogeman's Ethics, Discovering Right and Wrong, he says there's first the diversity thesis. What is considered morally right and wrong varies from society to society, so there are no moral principles that all societies accept. The dependency thesis aspect of relativism says that all moral principles derive their validity from cultural acceptance. And then ethical relativism based on these two theses says, therefore, there are no universally valid moral principles objective standards that apply to all people everywhere and at all times. 
Relativism ultimately says that morals are invented. There's two main types of relativism that we can talk about. First is subjectivism. This is an individualistic ethical relativism where it says that morals are personal opinion or preference. It makes morality ultimately useless. There's no obligation because you can change your mind, you can change your opinion whenever you want. If I determine what's right and wrong for me, then in what sense is a moral prescriptive? In what sense is it an obligation? It becomes useless. And then the other kind is conventionalism, which is cultural ethical relativism. It says that morals are social traditions. But what is a society? How big? Is the United States a society? Well, why do we disagree so much within the United States? We have Democrats, we have Republicans, we have Christians, we have Muslims, we have atheists, we have all these different groups. But let's take one group, all right? Let's take Democrats, for example. Within Democrats, there are many different religions. So let's break it down smaller. Let's just say, um, let's say Catholic, liberal Democrats, for example. But even within this group of people, there are many disagreements. And we go down and down and down to smaller and smaller groups until we have, think about your own family. Do you agree with the morals of everyone else in your family? Or do you think a little bit for yourself? Does your whole family think the same way about morals? If not, then why? If you disagree, then why do you disagree? If you disagree with anything that your family says, why do you disagree? You seem to be appealing to something else, something outside the family something outside the society. How big is a society? Could a society be just a society of one? Conventionalism ultimately is going to collapse into subjectivism, where morality is really just a person-by-person -person opinion. And if that's the case, then why do we even talk about morality? Why don't we just talk about opinion? Relativism loses its action-guiding quality. If it's just my opinion, I don't even have the same opinion today that I had a couple years ago. I grow, I change, I adapt. So in what sense are morals guiding my action? The implication is there's no independent way of criticizing any other culture or individual, and we ought to be tolerant of the moralities of other cultures. This means that we cannot say no to someone else. This tolerance is an acceptance of every view. Respectful conversation, not tolerance, but just respectful conversation, acknowledges that we can disagree and that I can say that you're wrong, but we still have a peaceful conversation where we can learn from each other and perhaps convince each other. Think about voting. Or think about any disagreement that you have with anyone. Every yes is also a no. Every disagreement says no. Every disagreement says that you are judging the other person's view is wrong or inadequate in some way. Why? Why don't you have the same view as that other person? Whatever the answer to your question is, is something that is not possible in ethical relativism because there's no independent way of criticizing any other culture or individual. We have to accept we can every again every yes is also a no, but we cannot say no. We cannot say that other ideas are wrong. Pozman summarizes by saying objectivism or subjectivism seems to boil down to anarchistic individualism. That's to say moral anarchy of individualistic nature an essential denial of the interpersonal feature of the moral point of view. And conventionalism, which does contain an interpersonal perspective, fails to deal adequately with the problem of the reformer, the question of defining a culture, and the whole enterprise of moral criticism.
this discussion that he is mentioning here of the reformer and the and moral criti criticism refers to something like the civil rights movement. All right. Once upon a time in the United States, we had slavery. Now we see that as morally reprehensible, and we have made moral progress, and we continue to do so in the wake of the civil rights movement, which in some sense still continues today. So we reform our own culture. We reform our own individual selves as we grow, as we criticize our own past, and we criticize some practices of some other cultures. This is not possible in relativism. Let's look at the traits of moral principles that we've discussed in a previous video and how they relate to relativism. Morals are supposed to be prescriptive. That means that they guide action. They, they impose an obligation on what you should do. It's not a description of just an option. You can like vanilla ice cream. You can choose chocolate ice cream. No, this is saying morals say that you should. You should choose a certain thing or a certain practice or general way of acting. But also universal. Something that applies to me also applies to you when we're in a similar circumstance. Morals apply to everyone in relevantly similar circumstances. Also, morals are overriding. That means they override other considerations. For example, emotion. I don't want to do my homework today, but I know that I should. So I do. I do the moral thing instead of the emotional thing, because the moral overrides the emotion. I don't want to give money to the poor, but I know that I should. I don't want to follow through with my promises, but I know that I should. I don't want to follow the laws, but I know that I should. And so morals override our emotion. Also, they're public. This just means that everyone can know them. There's no private sort of morality. It's not a secret what's moral. I mean, of course, wiser people know more about morality, but it's not a secret that they're trying to guard. They want to teach us, and we want to learn from wise people. That's why we're studying philosophy, honestly. They're public. Morals are public. Also, they're practicable. This means we can actually try to live them. We can actually develop a lifestyle centered around these morals. I can try to be more patient and actually become patient. I can become loving. I can grow in being honest. It's practicable. Let's talk about them in relation to ethical relativism. Remember, relativism says that truth is created by and relative to certain people and is not objective. This instantly denies the universal aspect. If, it's, if morals are relative to particular cultures, conventionalism, or individuals, subjectivism, all right, morals only apply to the individual who has them. If morals are just opinions, individual opinions, then they only apply to individuals. And there's no universality about it. That means that morals express emotion. If morals are just opinion, they just express emotional preference and do not override emotion. If, if morals are completely individualistic, and I feel like doing a certain thing, why should I be moral? Why shouldn't I just do what I feel like doing? Why? Why not? Morals don't override emotion. Morals are emotion. This means that they can't be public because my emotions change, my preferences change, and they're all within my own mind. And it's not public. In what sense is someone else needing, in, in what sense can someone else know my current state of emotion? Because I change my ideas. I change what my moral preferences are. But if that's the case, then morals do not override emotion, 
and morals cannot be public. They are ultimately individualistic. Anarchistic individualism, Posman called it. This means they cannot be prescriptive. There's no internal conflict between what you want to do and what you ought to do. Because if what you want to do depends on your own desire, and if what you ought to do is just a matter of your own opinion, in what sense do you have internal conflict? When you do think about, oh, I, I want to do this, but I should do that. I want to stay home and be lazy today, but I should go to work. Well, why should you go to work? You're appealing to something outside yourself, even if it's just consequences. Although generally we know that it's more than just consequences. I don't want to follow the traffic laws. I don't want to stop at this red light, but I know that I should. Of course, there's consequences if I do not. Uh, but at the same time, we know that there is something intrinsically moral going on there. I should not be rude to other people. I want to be rude to this person, but I should not be rude to this person. Why? I'm appealing to something. I'm appealing to something outside myself. Something like love of your neighbor. Generally, that's a good thing, but that's not just my opinion. It's a universal moral. Because of this lack of prescriptivity, morals become inconsistent. They have a double standard. Even within myself, I can change my mind about whether I'm a Democrat or a Republican, or whether I'm a Jew or a Muslim or an atheist. I can change my mind. I can change my own moral preferences. And so it's inconsistent. Not only that, but if morals are my own opinion, then that means that I have a different standard than you. And everyone has a different standard. There's a double standard here, and we can't even talk about morality anymore. Ultimately, this, this leads to a total decay of our being able to communicate and even function together as a society. It's ultimately not practicable. And therefore, it destroys morality. But let's look at objectivism. Objectivism says that morals are universal, real, and discovered. Right? It's something real about the world. They're valid for all people at all times in relevantly similar circumstances. This means that they're going to be able to override an individual person's emotion because it's bigger than the individual. It's going to override even legal considerations at times. Perhaps it is legal to have slaves a long time ago in the United States. But that does not mean it's moral. Even in the civil rights movement, you have Martin Luther King Jr. and others who follow him sometimes disobeying the law in order to do what is right. And gradually, that action actually changed the law, thankfully. So morals override emotion, override the law, and override other circumstantial variables because they're universal and only because they're universal. But this means that morals are also public. Everyone can know and judge morality with common human rationality. So we all know inside us, inside us that it's generally good to be loving or humble or preserve life or things like this. We know these things because we all have something in common. We all have rationality. Even if we apply rationality in slightly different ways, even if some people are more rational than other people, we can say your morals are wrong. Your understanding of morals are wrong because they are irrational. We can say that. And we can say, we can say this group of people have the right morality because it's reasonable, it's rational, it's built on evidence, it's thoughtful. And in this other group of people, it's irrational. So it's public. It's public because all people have rationality and can learn morality. 
It's not individualistic. Because of this, it means that it's prescriptive. You will have internal conflict. Morals are right, whether you believe them or not. And we've all experienced this. We've all had disagreements with people where someone thinks that something is right, but we think it's wrong. No, that's wrong, we tell our friends. No, we shouldn't do that. Try not to do that. You know, that's a bad thing to do. And we see things on TV and we say, oh, that's wrong. You shouldn't do that. This is because morals are right no matter whether or not you believe them. Kind of like the earth is round. The earth is a sphere. Even if you don't believe that, it's still true. Two plus two is four, even if, even if my baby doesn't know that. It's still true. White tigers exist, at least at the filming of this video. They exist. They exist somewhere in the world. And if you don't believe it, well, then you're wrong because they still do exist. That's just true whether you believe it or not. And this means that morals are ultimately practical because there's a consistent standard to live by. There's consistent morals that apply to all people in all places, in all times, in all races, in all religions, in relevantly similar circumstances. What does that mean? That means that everyone should be loving. Everyone should be patient. Everyone should be honest. Everyone should preserve life. Everyone should do these certain things. Even if they are applied in slightly different ways, in different contexts, there is a universal aspect to morality. And because of that, and only because of that, it is actually practicable. Because now that we have a consistent standard, now it makes sense of our internal debates. I want to do this, but I know that I should do that. I want to be lazy right now, but I know I should fulfill my responsibilities. This is life, and this, this encourages growth. A lazy person can gradually more and more often choose to do the responsible thing and grow to be a more responsible person. It's practicable, it's practicable and it makes sense of our common experience. And because of all of these things, objectivism makes morality ultimately possible. Think of objectivism like health. This is a food guide pyramid, the old version anyway. What kind of diet is healthy? What's healthy for one person may be different than another. But common principles apply to both. People should eat a healthy variety of foods in moderation and not excess. The amount of sugar a healthy child, a strong athlete, and a diabetic should eat are different. One common principle is applied differently depending on circumstance. So what's healthy? A healthy diet for one person may be unhealthy for another person, but at the end of the day we're still aiming at health through moderation and through some common principles. That's how we even can have something like a food guide pyramid. Because the food guide is a standard outside of us. It is saying, generally speaking, we need more bread than we need sugar. We need more fruit than we need meat. Fruits and vegetables are generally a good thing. Now, how specifically you apply those needs in your specific health considerations and your life, that may tweak you know, that may be applied in a slightly different way than someone else, but at the end of the day, in the general sense, we are following the same, the same principles. Everyone aims at the same ultimate good of happiness in morality, and true happiness will only be obtained through the ethical life. But each individual will apply universal morals differently in their circumstances. For example... If you want to be hospitable in America, you're going to shake a stranger's hand. That's a sign of welcome and peace, and you smile. But in Japan, you may bow instead of shaking someone's hand. These are both expressions of the same moral of hospitality, but they are expressed differently depending on the circumstance. Different people will choose different careers and relationships based on circumstance but all ethical people will still refrain from murder, love their neighbor, and apply their skills in responsible ways. 
even just the idea of figuring out what your skills are and apply them in ways that are responsible and help people and are fulfilling, that's a universal general kind of statement. And what that looks like in your life is going to be different than what it looks like in your friend's life or a family member's life or in my life. It's going to look a little bit different, but it's the same common moral principle. Universal morals are defined by reason and applied in different limited ways. Why are people attracted to relativism? First, there's a false dichotomy between relativism and non-conflicting moral absolutism. I'll discuss non-conflicting moral absolutism a little bit more here in a bit. Non-conflicting moral absolutism makes objectivism sound more radical than necessary. Second, equating objectivism with platonic transcendental realism. Sometimes this is just mistakenly called realism, but there's many types of realism. Instead of platonic transcendental realism, think about this. Morals can have independent universal status based on human reason, instead of being seen as separate metaphysical entities. In platonic transcendental realism, morals are seen as separate metaphysical entities, rather than just a universal standard based on human reason. So it's an oversimplification of objectivism as being just one specific kind of objectivism that is a very uncommon kind of objectivism. Third, the evils of ethnocentrism. Imperialism, both political and cultural, is where one country tries to invade and conquer another country. In political, this could mean conquering other countries' geographical location, kind of like uh, the Nazis were trying to do, or kind of like uh, England used to do, and many of the other European countries before America was founded, and that's why explorers came over and colonized the New World, Imper imperialism. But along with this spread of culture, oftentimes there's an ethnocentric ideal, which is to say, my cultural way of doing things is better than yours. So you should conform to our lifestyle. But a lot of times this is just wrong. And this is not based on morals. It's just based on custom. You should dress like us, talk like us, speak like us. You should, you should live life in our style. You should eat the foods that we eat. You should have our customs. Trying to impose those on other cultures is not moral and is not even based on morality. It's not for moral reasons. And because of those evils, people shy away from, uh, from thinking that morals are universal. And they want to acknowledge that morals could be relative just like customs could be relative. But that's not the case and ultimately it defeats the existence of morality completely. But we still want to verify that ethnocentrism Anthropocentrism is an evil. And we can only say that it is an evil because that is a universal objective statement. Ethnocentrism is evil. That's an objective statement. But if I was a relativist, then you could just disagree with me and say, oh, that's your opinion. And I think ethnocentrism is just fine. And I would have no way of saying you're wrong. You could say tolerance is a good thing, but then you would have to tolerate somebody who says tolerance is a bad thing. This unnecessarily leads to nobody can judge right and wrong. That's what this relativism based on an aversion to ethnocentrism ultimately leads to. We can maintain objective universal morals with culturally relevant application. Okay, There's still a difference between general moral principles as being universal and a culturally relevant and culturally relative application. There's a difference. Pojman says, the very reason that we are against ethnocentrism constitutes the basis for our favoring an objective moral system. Impartial reason draws us to it. We may well agree that cultures differ 
and that we ought to be cautious in condemning what we don't understand. But this is no but this in no way must imply that there are not better and worse ways of living. It's like saying just it's it's like saying, well, what's healthy for you is different than what's healthy for me, and we need to have different diets because we have different health needs. Well, that's true. But just because of that, that doesn't mean we can't tell somebody smoking is bad. We can't tell somebody you shouldn't eat sugar all the time. And you probably should not just live off of candy. That's not healthy for anybody. There's still universal standards going on. Four is a decline of religion. Now, this leads to, often has led to nihilism or relativism. Uh, Fyodor Dostoevsky said, if God is dead, all things are permitted, because in a religious view, God is the anchor point of morality. And the decline of religion in the Western world has uh, led to less regulation and guidance on uh, what is moral and what is not moral. And without that guidance, there can be a moral anarchy. There still needs to be guidance by reason, but if we reject reason and objective morality, then there's no guide and relativism ensues. Fifth, an overemphasis on neutrality. A neutral and objective point of view is ultimately impossible. But that doesn't mean morals are not objective. At the end of the day, we all have opinions, we all have a bias, we all have a perspective. And that will influence how we talk about things. But that doesn't mean that morals are not objective. Let's talk briefly about the natural law. What is the foundation for objective morality? The natural law is defined as, an obje as objective moral principles that are discoverable by human reason inherent in human nature. Humans, by nature, are reasonable, rational. Some people are slightly more or less rational, but at the end of the day, in virtue of our being human, we are rational creatures. And because we're rational creatures, we can all together understand and think about morality. And morality is discoverable through that reason. Sometimes this is presented as a, in a religious context, but it doesn't have to be. The first precept of the natural law, for example, is do good and avoid evil. Reason tells us that this is true. Universal reason that we all have, do good and avoid evil. This means everyone is aware of good and evil, and the choice is not arbitrary, like choosing your favorite color. Human reason tell, tells us we ought to do good. This isn't just like choosing your favorite color. You can just choose good or you can just choose evil. You can just choose blue or you can just choose green. Choosing your favorite color. No, there's actually an obligation here. One of them is better and one of them is what we ought to do. Good. Other precepts of the natural law might be things like don't murder, right? Reason just tells us this, that this has to be the case. It is irrational to think that murder would be okay. We would all be at each other's throats. Society would not be possible. Uh, we would not be able to preserve our race. We can't steal, lie maliciously, etc. Some general moral principles of the natural law. Objective moral principle is different than the application to, rel to relative circumstance. So considered in itself, murder is bad. Considered in itself, stealing is bad. Considered in itself, lying is generally bad. Considered in itself, shaking hands is neutral. Considered in itself, bowing is neutral. But when we try to apply common morals, such as hospitality, to a particular situation, all things considered, everything has morals implied. So considered in itself, shaking hands is neutral. But in America... If somebody sticks out their hand to you with a grin on their face, if you do not shake their hand, then you are expressing 
rudeness and you are not expressing the moral of hospitality. So something neutral has become something moral because of the circumstance, because of how the moral is applied. So who ultimately is to judge what's right and wrong? You. You judge what's right and wrong. And all people. Because we are all rational by nature. Pojman says, who's to judge what's right and wrong? The reply is, we are. Every rational being on earth. And we are to judge on the basis of the best reasoning we can bring forth, in dialogue with one another, and with sympathy and understanding. Ultimately, relativism is not practical and livable. It advocates tolerance but becomes intolerant. It becomes, don't tell me I'm wrong or you're speaking hate speech. It becomes that, which is intolerant. Conventional cultural rel relativism degrades into subjectivism as a pluralism of mutual respect degrades into individual tyranny in the name of tolerance. Let's talk about three kinds of absolutism. I briefly alluded to this earlier. The three kinds are non-conflicting, conflicting, and graded absolutism. Let's do an illustration. There was a woman named Corrie Ten Boom. She was a Christian, and she was hiding some Jews as Nazis were invading her country. This is Corrie Ten Boom. She hid them uh, in her house, for example. This is a hiding place in a wall in her house. Also, there was a hiding place under the table, under the kitchen table. So when Nazis came to the door and asked, are there any Jews living in your house? Should she lie or should she tell the truth? Well, the Nazis came and she lied to protect these people. Now, lying is generally immoral. But in this circumstance, did she do something immoral or not? If we say that she did something right, then are we confused? Are we contradicting ourselves? Why is lying okay sometimes and not okay other times? Maybe it is. Maybe it is wrong all the time. Should we tell truth or lies? And when should we tell either? How do we know? How do we ma maintain morality and consistency? Here's another illustration. It's famously called, Should Jim Kill the Indian? It, it was proposed by Bernard Williams. An Indian here, just as a caveat, this is the common title of this illustration, but Indian here refers to a Native American. Uh, specifically, this story takes place in Brazil. So you have an explorer. His name is Jim. He comes upon a village. And in this village, there is a warlord named Pedro. And Pedro has come and taken over the village with all of his soldiers. And he wants to control and exploit and uh, exercise violence on the people of this village. But they are unruly. And they, they tend to revolt and they're trying to escape. So he takes several of them and he wants to make a demonstration. Jim came along to this village and Pedro treats him as a guest. Pedro was going to kill 20 Indians, 20 Native Americans, to make a demonstration of his power. But he says, Jim, if you kill one, then I will let the rest of them go. If you kill just one person, I will let the rest of them go. So Jim has to choose between killing one or killing none, and then Pedro is going to kill all the others. So if Jim kills one, he will save the life of 19 others. Should he kill? Is this murder? Or is it not murder? Should we just take the consequences and that's, that overrides the consideration of duty? Or is duty more important than consequence? If consequence is more important than duty, it would seem like we can too often compromise duty, and that anything could be justified based on consequences. Then again, if duty is the primary consideration, 
And what should Jim do? Should he kill the Indian or not? Well, there's three kinds of absolutism to consider that deal with situations like this. First is non-conflicting moral absolutism. It says that there are many moral absolutes, absolute laws, and a person is bound by duty to never break any of them. So Corey Ten Boom should not have lied to the Nazis. Lying is always wrong. And if she wanted to preserve morality, she would have done what was wrong or what was right, even though it's hard. In fact, in any kind of morality, morality always says that sometimes you're going to have to do what's right even though it's hard. Even in relativism, sometimes you're going to have to do what's right even when it's hard. That's the essence of it being overriding. Even when it's hard, you got to do the right thing. So, should Jim kill the Indian? Jim should not shoot the Indian under non-conflicting moral absolutism because murder is always wrong. The second form of absolutism is conflicting absolutism. This says that when absolute moral laws conflict, it is a person's duty to do the lesser evil, knowing that another moral law is still being broken. So in other words, Jim is in a situation, and Corey is in a situation, where no matter what they do, they're going to break a law. They're going to do something immoral. So though it's wrong, Corey should lie because it's is less evil than betraying life. So when she lies, she does something immoral. But it would have been more immoral if she had, uh, if she had told the truth and uh, the people would have died. Now with Jim, though it's wrong to murder... Jim should still kill one to save many. Though it's wrong for him to murder, that's less wrong than letting all these other people die. The third form of absolutism is graded absolutism. This says absolute moral laws form a hierarchy. When they conflict, it is a person's duty to follow the higher law. This does not break any moral law. So, Corey should lie because preserving life is a more important value than honesty. Or, she shouldn't lie because honesty trumps preserving life, whichever way you cut it. Let's just take the first one, for example. This is to say, preserving life is more important than honesty. That means when she tells a lie, she's not doing anything wrong. She's actually doing something right. Because she is preserving life. This is different than conflicting absolutism. Because conflicting absolutism would say that no matter what she does, she is still doing something immoral. But she should do the lesser immorality. Graded absolutism says there is a way that she can still do something that is completely moral and not immoral in any way. So she tells a lie, and this preserves life. Or perhaps a different way around, maybe she shouldn't lie because honesty trumps the preservation of life, whichever way the hierarchy goes. With Jim, Jim should kill the Indian. Saving many trumps murdering one. It depends on which moral principle is higher on the hierarchy, is more important. Because we grade the different moral principles as more and less important. Now let's go to the write-up. Relativism versus Objectivism. What is the worst evil you can imagine? Imagine that someone says to you, that's your opinion, and I'll do it if I want to. Once you imagine that, what is your response to that person? What reason do you give for your response? Would you try to change their mind? Why? How? What would you say? Where do morals come from? I'm not asking where you learn morals from, but where they come from. We all learn morals from our parents or from society, but we also learn math from school teachers. But the school teachers did not invent math, but how about morals? When we learn morals from parents or 
religion or society, did those things create morality or not? Where do morals themselves actually come from? That's what I'm asking. Do you have any right to tell someone they're wrong? Why? That's the end of this lecture. Keep watching the, the other lectures as you keep going along in this course. I encourage you to email me any questions that you have so that I can continue the conversation and perhaps improve this lecture in the future. Thank you.